Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I hope that you all are doing well. I hope that you slept well. And I hope that you're ready for a very challenging message. Um, this week I was a bit overwhelmed by the message itself, if I can be completely honest. But before I get to that, I'd like to first tell a story of something that Sophia and I encountered while we were still living in England. Now, it was on southwest London. I think it was Westminster or something. I can't really remember, but it was a bit more of a posh area, if you will. So the reason I'm mentioning this is we were walking there. She had to get something for work or something, and we were walking in this market-type street, and we saw the street entertainer, and he was there, and he was entertaining the people. Very much, that's where he got his name. But he was a street entertainer, and he's, he's just doing some tricks and just doing some stuff so that people can actually pay him and put money on the floor, and, and that's how he pays his bills. But that's not the story. The story was in this whole entertainment section, because you see this group, and then you start following them, and you, and you go stand there, and you, you know, you try and stand there close enough so that you can see, but not close enough so, to, so that you feel compelled to give money. You know, don't pretend like it's just me. <laughs> Any case, so we're standing there, and we're looking at this unfold, and at one stage, he asked for two volunteers. No, we did not volunteer, but he asked for two children. And there's one girl about... Yay tall, stood there by him, and then a little boy of about... So there's a bit of a height difference, as you generally get with kids that age. And when everybody is there, he says, okay, give them a hand. And as they give them a hand, he tells them, okay, face each other. And the one standing there, the other one standing there. And as a joke, I need to emphasize this. Everybody knew it. As a joke, he said, fight. And before he even finished this word fight, this girl being taller than this little guy, windmilled him and just started attacking this poor little guy who had no idea what was going to happen. This was just sort of as a way to make people laugh, but she just went at him. And I can say this, and we laughed, and everybody laughed. I'm sure that the little boy's parents didn't laugh, <laughs> or him. But the thing is, all I can imagine at this stage, what I want us to emphasize on is, number one, I don't think that she did it in a bad heart. Um, but I do think that maybe she has brothers at home and she needs to fend for herself, or she's just very good at following instructions. <laughs> now, the thing is, we can laugh at this story, and it's a true story. Um, but what I think we as a church do is very often we do this. Like, there would be a situation, or someone would disagree, or, or someone would say something that we don't like. And the first thing that we do is we start fighting. And very often you think, is there a real cause? Is there a real reason for us to start windmilling this poor little kid? Sometimes we just need to say, okay, listen, I, I disagree. You know, it's, it's just something in us that wants to attack. And I mention this because today we're discussing or starting a series or a topic of something that I generally try to avoid because it tends to lead people to fighting or it tends to cause people to lose focus. And this is why I was challenged this week, because although I do know somewhat about the topic and I find it interesting, it's not something that I dwell on. And whenever other people get, start getting fixated on it, I generally try to persuade them otherwise. To say, listen, let's, let's, let's understand this, but then let's move in this direction because we're losing focus. So that's my heart generally. And then this week as I studied and I looked into Scripture and I challenged my own thinking because during this week everything that I thought I knew about this topic I realized was a bit off. It was just next to the truth. It wasn't right. And I want to encourage all of you obviously to believe what I believe but that's not the point. The point is what I'm trying to say is in this week I had to challenge my own beliefs and find truth above what I felt was convenient because how I saw Christianity I realized is a bit different than the true reality. And the reason I say this is because today we're starting with prophecy. Because the first part of Daniel, as we saw, discusses Daniel and his friends going through basically three different types of kings and how God works individually with all three kings. First with Nebuchadnezzar, then Belshazzar, and then Darius. Those are the three kings that we see happening. Now with the prophecies, he starts going back and says, okay, listen, while this happened, this happened to me. And this is what he's sharing in this thing. But now, before we start, I need to emphasize what exactly prophecy is, because we need to define what we're busy with. Because prophecy for us very often means we're telling the future. And in a way, that's sort of true, but it's not really true. Because what prophecy is, it's not a roadmap or a step-by-step -step instruction. It's 
more of a roadmap, if you will. Because what we see is prophecy, okay, this happens, so now we need to take this step and this step, and that's not what prophecy is. Prophecy is warning, and it gives us information about what might happen. It gives us encouragement in times of trouble, because we know that God already knew this was going to happen. And sometimes it's also a warning, where God just says, listen, if you continue with this, then this will happen. Very much like parents do with children. You touch that thing one more time. All the parents are going, he knows, <laughs> he knows. And that's sometimes what God does, but he doesn't do it with that tone of voice. He's just saying, I don't want to punish you, but if you carry on doing this, this will happen. So this is in a nutshell what prophecy is, but where people start getting confused and why I dislike the topic sometimes is because sometimes we get so fixated on a certain things, certain thing that we get confused. Because here we see two passages from the book of Isaiah. Okay, I chose from the same book on purpose. And it gives two different destinations when we start looking at it. The first is that the Messiah, I realize now I didn't put in capital letters, so in your mind put a capital M there. And it says, Isaiah 9 verse 7, Of the increase of his government and the peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and judgment from henceforth ever, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So here we see a prophecy where they're saying, listen, when the Messiah comes, his government, his kingdom will last forever. And this is what the Jews were expecting, because this is what they also wanted. And conveniently, they chose to ignore the second prophecy, also from the same book, also giving more detail about the Messiah. But here it says that he will suffer. But he, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Now what happens when we start discussing prophecy is we start fixating on either this one or this one. And what happens when we do this is we start putting a plot or a direction or instructions and then very often we get lost. The second one that sometimes confuses us. Now remember, before Jesus came, there was also a prophecy where he said that he would enter the city on a colt, on a donkey. On a donkey. Now with that, the Bible also clearly says that he will come on clouds. Look at Mark 13 verse 26 and it says, and they, shall see, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. This was Jesus speaking here. Remember when he ascended, also there was an angel telling the group of people there saying, why are you looking up in the air? Just as you see him there, he's going to come back on clouds. But then we look at Revelation, the Messiah will come on a white horse. And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he that sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Now these things can confuse us, because how can he come on the clouds, but also on a horse? Now he's saying, okay, he's coming on a, on a horse through the clouds. It's sort of, but also not. But we'll get to that when we get to that. For now, all I need us to do is to sit back and let truth reign. If there's something that I'm missing, please share afterwards. First see where I'm going. But with that, let's start with Daniel chapter 7. <clears throat> and in the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and a vision of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spoke and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea, and the four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse from one another. So what is he saying? He had a dream and he saw this big sea and then four winds would come from four different places. Now the thing is, Bible scholars and also the angel who interprets it a bit later on tells us that these four winds are four kingdoms, if you will. Now the thing is, what does this mean? And the first was like a lion and it had eagle's wings and I beheld the wings thereof and I... And, sorry, let's try again. The first was like a lion and, and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it. So first of all, yes, it's okay to be confused at this stage. Carrying on from there. And behold, another beast, a second like, like to a bear and it raised up itself on one side and it had three ribs in its mouth of... Um, in his mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon its back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast also had four heads, 
and dominion was given to it. Once again, I say it's okay to be confused, because later on we see Daniel also being confused. Now, before we carry on, I want to sort of share a type of interpretation. Or I want to share some information before we get to the angel's interpretation so that you can at least sort of have an idea of where this is going. Now, Bible scholars and people who really put in the time to try and decipher these things and to pray about it and who look at the scripture, they have different opinions about this. And this is sort of where people can either agree to disagree or they can fight. Now, some people say that the first one, because remember, there's four beasts. We're only talking about the first three now. The first three beasts. The first one was a lion with eagle's wings. Now, this was also the symbol of Babylon. So some people say this is the Babylonian Empire. The second animal was a bear. Some people say, okay, this is the Mede-Persian Empire, because this is also a symbol for them. And then the third one, they say, is the Greeks. Then they say the fourth one, for example, is the Roman Empire. And then they say, okay, so all of these things already happened. And this might be true, and it might be true in partial fulfillment as well. I'm not saying this is completely wrong, but if we look at what the angel says a bit later on, he says that these things will happen. Now, this is happening with the second kingdom. Babylon already fell. So it, it makes it difficult if we start looking at this will happen, but Babylon already fell. Now you can say, okay, but it still can be, and it, it could be. I'm not saying that it's not, and I don't think that we should fight about it. What I think, and I might be wrong, probably are, but I still think that it makes sense. The first one, for example, what country is known as the lion? So you can look at, for example, the UK, the British lion. This is very often what happens. But very often the UK has also formed an alliance with the, with the USA. So what I'm thinking, I'm thinking in the future, the UK and the USA will form an alliance for some apparent reason for what apparent cause and they will stand together and then where things start getting interesting for me I believe is with the second one where they talk about the bear with three ribs in its mouth and especially after this week where the country known as a bear Russia declared war on a smaller country the Ukraine let's not get into the politics the point is they're fighting with the Ukraine which is a smaller country which if I try and plot this ahead in my head I can think that the Ukraine is one of three ribs that will fall in war. The third one, there are some people who say that this is the UN. They're saying, but why the UN? Well, the UN put up an idol or a structure or thing right in front of it that they see as the, the Statue of Freedom, which is a, actually a very beautiful statue, by the way, but it's this leopard that just stands like this with a growling face with two wings on its back. And some people say, see, that's the UN, that's the third power. But the thing is, this leopard has four heads and four wings. But this is, once again, it's all speculation. We don't know. All that I need us to understand is that if we look at the Bible prophecy, it talks about four different powers in the world acting at sort of the same time. It's not successive. That's not what we see. So it doesn't make sense to me if it's one power, then the next, then the next, then the next. But I don't want us to stick on this. Let's see where this is going. But at least now you have a better idea more than just it's four random animals, if you understand what I'm saying. If I lost you already, don't worry, we're hopefully going to get you back. So now we see the three animals. Let's have a look at the fourth animal. After this, I saw a night vision and behold the fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth and it devoured and break in pieces and it stamped the residue um, with the feet of it. And, there was div and it was diverse from the other beasts that were before it and it had ten horns. It's not even describing the animal. It's just saying that this is a beast with ten horns. It could be a dragon. It could be one of those dinosaurs with the things on its back. It could be a dinosaur or buffalo or whatever. The thing is, this is a horrible beast with horns. And I considered the horns and behold, there came among them another little horn before whom there was three of, of the first horns plucked by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and the mouth speaking great things. So yes, a confusing beast with horns. If you just remember that, that's fine. Okay, carrying on. I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the Ancient of Days sat with um, whose garment was white as snow. So now it looks to me like we're moving from these beasts to God, whose garment was as white as snow and his hair was like pure wool and his throne was like a fiery flame and his wheels as a burning fire. Just take it as it is. 
A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten, ten thousand stood before him. That's a hundred million stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. I beheld, because of the voice of the great words which were the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain. So this is the fourth beast being slain after we spoke about God. And his body was destroyed and given to the burning flame. And concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion, so their power taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. It's confusing, but it looks like we're winning. Okay, it looks like we're winning. Just stay with me. It looks like we're winning. I saw the night vision and beheld, and behold, one like the Son of Man, capital S, so is God. Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and he came with the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and kingdom that all the people and the nations and languages should serve him. His dominion and everlasting dominion. Who are we speaking about? Jesus. Which shall not pass away in his kingdom, that's that which shall not be destroyed. Okay, so it's four kingdoms, bit of confusion, but we win. Okay, so we've got the kingdom. Wonderful. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit very much as some of you are now. It's confusing and my body and the vision of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those that stood by me and asked him the truth of all this because even Daniel was confused. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of these things. These grace beach, beasts which are four, are four kings. Okay, so now we get confirmation. It's four kings or emperors or presidents or whatever which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Okay? So it doesn't look like we're wrong thus far. This is what the angel is saying. So we win and forever and ever. But now things can look to get confusing. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast. So now Daniel wants more information about the fourth beast which was diverse from the others. It was different. Exceedingly dreadful or exceeding dreadful whose teeth were of Iron and his nails of brass, which, did, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. And the ten horns, which were in his head, and the others which came up, and before him fell three, even of that horn, had eyes and a mouth, and spake very great things. So this horn had eyes and mouth, and he spake many great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. So the one horn was more stout than the others. I beheld the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. And now I was saying, but wait, I thought we won. Okay, so now we get confused because we had the kingdom and now we see that we lost the kingdom because we lost. And I beheld the same horn made a war against the saints and prevailed against them. Until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Okay, so we had the kingdom, we lost the kingdom, we had the kingdom, then we lost the kingdom. There's more. Thus said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from the other kingdom. So this kingdom shall be like nothing else ever before. And shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down, and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of the kingdom are the ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue the three kings. Just bear with me. It will make sense. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and he shall wear out the saints. So now we're losing again. And think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hands, given into his hands. So now we're losing properly because we're being given into his hands. Until a time and times and a dividing of times. Now if you look at the Bible, I'm not going to get into it now. You're more than welcome to come ask me afterwards or Google it or whatever. But when they say a time and times and a dividing of a time means three and a half years. A time, one year, times, two years, one plus two, three, and half a time, a dividing of a time, three and a half years. Just keep that here somewhere. We're going to get back to that now. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion, this being the fourth king, to consume and destroy it unto the end, and the kingdom and the dominion, and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole earth shall be given to the people of the saints. Yay, we win again. <laughs> And the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey Him. And here comes the end. Hitherto the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my, co my cogitations was much troubled me, and my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. 
He was upset. He was confused. Very much like some of you. But he kept the matter in his heart. Now I'm saying, Johan, how on earth are you going to get a me message out of we win, we lose, we win, we lose, we win, we lose? Well, first of all, it helps if you actually look at the text itself and what's happening. If you put it next to each other like this, this is the same text. Daniel 7, 17 to 18, where things start getting confusing. The blue parts, this is where the beasts rule, if you will. So first they tell the story like a man. We lose, we win. Okay, that's the moral of the story. You can ask a man, what happened? Why are you late? Well, our car broke. If you ask a woman, what happened? Why are you late? Well, the alternator and this broke. And then after that, we had to go to the back of the tire. Then we saw that the fl flat was tired. And there's, there's so much more detail given. So this is the man version. This is the man with his wife. And this is the man going to get a drink somewhere. His wife tells the story. Okay, so it's the same type of thing. He t I'm glad that you're laughing. So he tells the story. Then he retells the story with more detail. Then he retells the story with even more detail. Okay? So first, the beasts are in control, but then we get the kingdom. Now here's the important part. What happens in the second retelling? In the second retelling, in verse 21, it says here, there, and I beheld, so the beasts have the kingdom, and I beheld the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. So the beasts are in control, then we lose, then we win. Second, this on the third section. The beasts are in control, and they shall speak great words against the Most High, so they will be very blasphemous and saying horrible things towards God. Who here sometimes feels that that's happening now? And they shall wear out the saints. Don't let them wear you out. And they shall think and change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hands until the time and times of dividing of a time. So for three and a half, things will suck, but then... The judgment shall sit and we will win again. Focus on that. You can worry about the details when you get home and you study it for yourself because please double check even me. Double check everyone and everything because guess what? I will disappoint. I will make mistakes but everything in me I will try not to. And this is where we got to this. But now, this is the important thing and I don't want to emphasize this too much because we will get to it once we finish the book of Daniel. When we finish the book of Daniel, then I will have a proper look, and we will have a proper meeting about what I believe the Bible teaches regarding the end times. Because I always thought, okay, life is going to be a certain way, and then we're going to be raptured, and then something's going to happen. And then, with further study, I realized, okay, but listen, this is, might not be the case. So I'm only going to touch on a short section, which we still see here, okay? What the Bible teaches as you see in Daniel 9, so that's why I first want us to finish Daniel before we get to just looking at everything properly. So life carries on from here. Then the Antichrist in Daniel 9, and then there's other texts as well, speaks about the Antichrist making a treaty with what we believe is Israel because they start speaking about the temple. Currently there isn't a temple in Jerusalem that is solely for God. It's a triple temple between the Muslims, the Christians, and someone else I can't remember. When this treaty is being made, let me just pause here for a second. When you build something, when you walk into a property or onto a property like this, you decide for yourself, okay, listen, I'm going to put a post here. And then from here, I'm going to measure 10 meters, put another post. And then I'm going to walk 10 meters, I'm going to put another post. What Jesus does, number one, we know that we don't know when things are going to happen. But what Jesus does very clearly In Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, he tells us where this first post is. Once we have this first post, when this happens, then we know some information. Okay, I'm going to get to that now. So from there, just very quickly, because I don't want to emphasize this too much. When this happens, there's going to be three and a half years of Christians falling away, left, right, and center, and it's horrible. Because we're going to be too focused on the world, on times and troubles, and things are going to be difficult, or things are going to be too easy. I've realized that both extremes sort of cause Christians to fail away. This is not what I'm saying, this is what the Bible is saying. Then once the Antichrist who made a peace treaty breaks his promise, second peg, three and a half years, times and times and times, great tribulation. I don't want to say this, but we're going through some tough times. Then, when the sun and moon get dark, because when we see this, and this is just an example, just 
call it a hint of what we're headed towards. There's a time in Matthew, Mark, and Luke where the disciples explicitly go to Jesus and say, listen, tell us about the end of the world. He does this, they do this privately on a mountain, and he tells them basically four different pegs. First, he tells them, okay, listen, there's going to be a falling away. See the blue? There's going to be a falling away in all three parts, exactly the same order. Then the green part, which we see here, Antichrist breaks the promise. That's the second point. The moment you see that, then Jesus says, run. That's his words. If you're on your housetop, don't think about going down and grabbing stuff. Wherever you are, run for the hills. There's going to be times and tribulations like this world has never seen before. And this is not my words, this is Jesus. Right there, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He says, you're going to wish that you never had children. You're going to pray that this happens in the summer so that you don't freeze to death outside. There's tough times coming. And I can't stress this enough. I can't grasp it enough in my head. And this is keeping me, I don't know how to work this out. But then after that, when this happens, and every time when the sun and moon get dark, then when the sun and moon get dark, then when the sun and moon gets dark. He doesn't talk about prophecy. He says, once this, then this. Immediately after this, then this happens. Jesus speaks chronologically of how things will happen. And this helps us look at prophecies as we just saw. Once the sun and moon gets dark, Jesus will come on a cloud, meet us halfway, and then that's when we're raptured. That's when we all, our race is done. We can rest for those of who are alive at that time. Then after that, for 1,040 days, God's wrath is going to go into the world like never before. Because there's a difference. The Bible speaks about the day of Christ and it speaks about the day of the Lord. The day of Christ is when we get we get to join God, when we get to join Jesus in heaven, and that's called the marriage supper of God, something like that, the marriage supper. That's when we go to the uttermost part, if you read in Mark, they talk about the uttermost part of heaven, where we spend time with God while He's just inflicting absolute hell on earth. And then, that's when the day of the Lord starts, and then He comes down on the white horse, and He reigns for a thousand years. That's not the emphasis. All we're focusing on now, and we'll get to the rest when we get there, and we'll do a proper in-depth study on it as a church service together. For now, all that I need us to focus on, or what I feel Daniel 7 is teaching us, is that tough times are coming, as we saw confirmed by Jesus, in the same order, dun dun dun, as we saw here. Beheld, tough times are coming, tough times are coming. Saying, Johan, that's not very encouraging. What is encouraging is that we know what's going to happen. It might be in our generation, it might be in the next. All I know is, as I looked at this, I don't want to say, let's just hang on and know the tough times are coming and when this happens, just be. What troubles me, and this is what I want to share with you, and I want to share this with you from my heart. When I start speaking about the great falling away and the great tribulation, I look at us as Christians We get riled up, we start fighting, we start disagreeing, we start hating our life and we start turning against God when things don't happen the way that we want them to. When we don't get that promotion, when we don't have enough money to buy what we want, when we want to buy it. When the water's off, when the electricity is off. For us, that's trials and tribulations. Regardless of whether my theology regarding the end time is right or not, do you really think that we're living the full extent of what Jesus wants when he saved us? Are we prepared to go through tough times for the sake of God or are we going to say what so many people have told me directly and purposely and what I've seen on the internet and what I've seen in churches? Well, if God does this, then I don't want to believe. That's literally the equivalent of saying, well, if my bank account is empty, well, I'm not going to bank with them. If it's empty, it's empty. That's what what it is. You, You can't change it. If that's what God is allowing, that's what He's allowing. He's in charge. But the one thing that I hold on to is once all of this has happened, once all of this has been completed, the Bible explains how we all proclaim His glory and see how wonderfully good He is because then we will see the full picture. Then we will see that from the start, throughout all this tribulation, God had a purpose that today I can't grasp, that I don't like because I don't want us to go through difficult times. I don't want people to fall away. But the thing is we can either share messages where we say, life's going to be good, We can go to prophetic conferences where not a single bad thing is said. 
Because we see this. People go to prophetic conferences and the whole weekend or the whole week or the whole whatever, this guy is just telling them, God is telling you you're going to do great things. God is telling you you're amazing. If I look at the Bible, I see that happening absolutely zero times. If I see a prophet of God going to his people, I see God saying, you better shape up. You better fix up. Tough times are coming. And it's not because God is a vengeful God or He wants to smack you like a bad parent. There's greater things at play. It's a tough message. I really don't want to share tough messages. But I really, was, at this time, and I was thinking about it this morning, if we don't start getting what we're a part of, we're going to be those that fall away. We need to start grasping what we're a part of. Because we see our life as... We're doing a life and I spend time with God and every now and again I share with Him what I need and sometimes I pray for the sick. Sometimes I try and spend my money better. God, what do you want me to do with my free time? I've got Saturday for about two hours. Do you want me to help with this project or not? This is what we do. God is calling us to get deeper. How are we going to withstand difficult times? Even if I'm completely wrong. Don't you think that it's better if we cling on to God on a better way? If we keep the matter in our hearts, and if we keep God's word in our heart. But then how do we do this? We read our Bible with questions. We come to church regardless of what the weather, regardless of whether you want to sleep late. If you can be at your job every single day, you can be at church. And it's not about this message. It's not. It's about being able to be strong. Because in tough times, guess who we're going to lean on? Each other. No, but I only know his first name. I don't like him. Tough times are coming and you're going to have to lead on him or lean on him. Maybe I'm missing it. I don't know. All I'm saying is I feel God saying we should keep these matters in our heart because Daniel didn't understand this fully. I know I don't. All I know is that we need to cling on to God. That's it. But I feel that we are called to cling on more. And I don't want to keep on repeating and repeating, but I just, even last night while I was speaking to Sophia about this message and just sort of sharing, I realized I can't express the concern I have for us and for the future Christians because we, something like COVID and inconvenience in church keep people from coming to church because I need to wear a mask. If that's tribulation in your life, how deep is our faith? And I share this with love because a lot of people are not going to like this message. A lot of people are going to fall away. I'm not saying it. God did Let's not be those. Let's be a full church where all of us endured till the end. I'm saying, no, but God says, you know, the saints are not appointed unto wrath. Yes, because we get summoned up before the wrath. But there's countless times where God talks about the tribulation. We're not appointed to wrath. You're completely correct. But the world's going to hate us. They already do. Let's close our eyes and pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I pray for truth. I pray for open hearts. I pray for us to endure. God, please help us focus on you, Lord. Help us not get overwhelmed or scared. Help us cling on to you, Lord, knowing that you know everything that's going to happen, Lord. Help us cling on to the fact that we're part of an eternal plan and not just the 60, 70, 80, or 100 years that you bless us with here on earth, Lord. We ask that you please hold us tight, Lord. Encourage us. Help us to grow. Help us read our Bibles and help us hear you clearly when we pray, Lord. Help us seek you earnestly, Lord. Amen.